The car went fleeing up the canyon, and the air was fresh and cool, as if it had been new washed in some clear mountain stream, and the smell of pine came down between the walls like the smell of a faint and delicate perfume. Perhaps, he told himself, it had been with no thought of helping him that the thing inside his brain had acted as it did. Rather, it might have been an almost automatic reflex action for the preservation of itself. But no matter what it was, it had saved him as surely as itself. For the two of them were one. No longer could either of them act independently of the other. They were bound together by the leisure domain of that sprawling pinkness on that other planet, by the double of the thing that had come to live with him, for the thing within his mind was a shadow of its other self, five thousand years distant. Half trouble? Harriet asked. I met up with Freddy. Freddy Bates, you mean? He's the one and only Freddy, the little nincompoop. Your little nincompoop, said Blaine, was packing a gun and he had blood within his eyes. You don't mean, Harriet, said Blaine. This is liable to get rough. Why don't you let me out? Not on your life, said Harriet. I've never had so much fun in all my life. You aren't going anywhere. You haven't much road left. Shep, you may not think it to look at me, but I'm the intellectual type. I do a lot of reading, and I like history best of all. Bloody battle history, especially if there are a lot of campaign maps to follow. So? So I found out one thing. It is always a good idea to have a line of retreat laid out. But not up this road. Up this road, she said. He turned his head and watched her profile, and she didn't look the part. Not the hard-boiled newspaper gal that she really was. No chatter-column writer, nor a sob-sister, nor a society hen, but one of the dozen or so top-notch reporters spelling out the big picture of Fishhook for one of the biggest newspapers in North America. And yet as chic, he thought, as a fashion model. Chic without being sleek, and with an air of quiet assurance that would have been arrogance in any other woman. There was nothing, he was sure, that could be known of Fishhook which she didn't know. She wrote with a strangely objective viewpoint, one might almost say detached. But even in that rare atmosphere of journalistic prose, she injected a soft sense of human warmth. And in the face of all of this, what was she doing here? She was a friend, of course. He had known her for years, ever since that day shortly after she had arrived at Fishhook and they had gone to dinner at the little place where the old blind woman still sold roses. He had bought her a rose, he remembered, and being far from home and lonesome, she had cried a little. But he told himself she'd probably not cried since. Strange, he thought, but it all was strange. Fishhook itself was a modern nightmare which the outer world, in a century's time, had not quite accepted. He wondered what it had been like that century ago, when the men of science had finally given up, when they had admitted that man was not for space, and all the years were dead and all the dreams were futile, and man had finally ended up in a little planetary dead end, for the gods had toppled and man, in his secret mind, had known that after all the years of yearnings, he had achieved nothing more than gadgets. Hope had fallen on hard times, and the dreams had dwindled and the trap closed tight, but the urge to space had refused to die, for there was a group of very stubborn men who took another road, a road that man had missed or deserted, whichever you might choose many years ago and ever since that time had sneered at and damned with the name of magic. For magic was a childish thing. It was an old wives' tale. It was something out of nursery books. And in the hard and brittle world of the road that man had taken, it was intolerable. You were out of your mind if you believed in magic. But the stubborn men had believed in it, or at least in the principle of this thing which the world called magic for it was not actually magic if one used the connotation which through the years had been placed upon the word. Rather, it was a principle as true as the principles which underlay the physical sciences. But rather than a physical science, it was a mental science. It concerned the using of the mind and the extension of the mind, instead of the using of the hands 
and the extensions of the hands. Out of this stubbornness and this belief and faith, Fishhook had arisen. Fishhook because it was a reaching out, a fishing into space, a going of the mind where the body could not go. Ahead of the car, the road swung to the right, then swiveled to the left in a tightening curve. This was the turnaround. Here, the road came to an end. Hang on, said Harriet. She swung the car off the road and nosed it up a rocky stream bed that ran along one of the canyon walls. The air jets roared and blustered. The engines throbbed and howled. Branches scraped along the bubble top, and the car tilted sharply, then brought itself aright. This is not too bad, said Harriet. There is a place or two later on where it gets a little rough. This is the line of retreat you were talking about? That's exactly right. And why, he wondered, should Harriet Quimby need a line of retreat? He almost asked her, but decided not to. She drove cautiously, traveling in the dry creek bed, clinging close against the wall of rock that came down out of darkness. Birds fled squalling from the bushes, and branches dragged against the car, screeching in their agony of tortured wood. The headlights showed a sharp bend with a barn-sized boulder hemming in the wall of rock. The car slowed to a crawl, thrust its nose into the space between the boulder and the wall, swiveled its rear around, and went inching through the space into the clear again. Harriet cut down the jets, and the car sank to the ground, grating on the gravel in the creek bed. The jets cut out, and the engine stopped and silence closed upon them. We walk from here? asked Blaine. No, we only wait a while. They'll come hunting for us. If they heard the jets, they'd know where we had gone. You go clear to the top? Clear to the top, she said. You have driven it? he asked. Many times, she told him. Because I knew if the time ever came to use it, I'd have to use it fast. There'd be no time for guessing or for doubling back. I'd have to know the trail. But why, in the name of God? Look, Shep, you're in a jam. I get you out of it. Shall we let it go at that? If that's the way you want it, sure. But you're sticking out your neck. There's no need to stick it out. I've stuck out my neck before. A good newsman sticks out the neck whenever there is need to. That might be true, he told himself, but not to this extent. There were a lot of newspaper men in Fishhook, and he drank with most of them. There were a few he could even call his friends. And yet no one of them, no one but Harriet, would do what she was doing. So newspapering by itself could not be the answer. Nor could friendship be the entire answer either. It was something more than either, perhaps a good deal more than either. The answer might be that Harriet was not a newswoman only. She must be something else. There must be another interest and a most compelling one. One of the other times you stuck your neck out. Did you stick it out for stone? No, she said. I only heard of stone. They sat in the car, listening, and from far down the canyon came the faint muttering of jets. The muttering came swiftly up the road, and Blaine tried to count them, and it seemed that there were three, but he could not be sure. The cars came to the turnaround and stopped, and men got out of them and trampled into the brush. They called to one another. Harriet put out a hand, and her fingers clamped around Blaine's arm. Shep, what did you do to Freddy? Picture of a grinning death's head. Knocked him out is all. And he had a gun? Took it away from him. Freddy in a coffin, with a tight smile on his painted face, with a monstrous lily stuck between his folded hands. No, not that. Freddy with a puffed-up eye, with a bloody nose, a crosshatch of patches on his blotchy face. They sat quietly listening. The shouts of the men died away, and the cars started up and went down the road. Now? We'll wait, said Harriet. Three came up. Only two went back. There is still one waiting. A row of listening ears all stretched out of shape with straining for a sound. They're sure we came up the road. They don't know where we are. This is a gaping trap with jagged rows of teeth. They'll figure we'll think they went away and we'll betray ourselves. They waited. Somewhere in the woods a raccoon wickered, and a bird disturbed by some nighttime prowler protested sleepily. There is a place, said Harriet, a place where you'll be safe 
if you want to go there. Any place. I haven't any choice. You know what the outside's like? I've heard. They have signs in some towns. A billboard with the words, Perry, don't let the sun set on you here. They have prejudice and intolerance, and there are bearded, old-time preachers thumping pulpits, men clad in nightgowns with masks upon their faces and rope and whip in hand, bewildered, frightened people cowering beneath a symbolic bramble bush. She said in a vocal whisper, It's a dirty, stinking shame. Down on the road, the car had started up. They listened to it leave. They gave up finally, said Harriet. They may still have left a man behind, but we'll have to chance that. She started the engine and turned up the jets. With the lights switched on, the car nosed up the stream bed. The way grew steeper, and the bed pinched out. The car moved along a hog's back, dodging clumps of bushes. They picked up a wall of rock again, but it was on the left side now. The car dipped into a crevasse, no more than a paint layer distant away from either side, and they inched along it. The crevasse pinched sharply out, and they were on a narrow ledge with black rock above and black emptiness below. For an eternity, they climbed, and the wind grew chill and bitter, and finally before them was a flatness, flooded by a moon dipping toward the west. Harriet stopped the car and slumped in the seat. Blaine got out, and fumbled in his pocket for a pack of cigarettes. He finally found it, and there was only one left in the pack. It was very badly crumpled. He straightened it out carefully and lit it. Then he walked around the car and stuck it between Harriet's lips. She puffed on it gratefully. The border's up ahead, she said. You take the wheel. Another fifty miles across country, very easy going. There's a little town where we can stop for breakfast.